Hello class, welcome to HRMT62, week two, personality and values. Uh, my name is Mustafa Nazari, and this is my lecture for week number two. I just want to make it a little bit short for you so you guys uh, can watch this video before coming to our class and get familiar with some key concepts in week number two. Uh, let's go and see the agenda for today. The lectures highlights would be, first of all, I'll welcome you to the world of talent management, OB and HRMT. Then in this lecture, I'll talk about personality and the big five personality index, the dark triad of personality, MBTI types index, Schwartz analysis of values, four ethical principles, uh, some factors affecting ethical behaviors and conducts, and finally, some cross-cultural values. This is going to be our focus for this week. I, I would like to begin with a quotation by Steve Jobs. Innovation has nothing to do with how many R&D dollars you have. It's not about money. It's about the people you have, how you are led, and how much you get it. So you can see here, the focus would be on people, individuals who are working in one company. Let's just have a very quick look at the key elements related to OB. OB is about people, people who are working, those people who have feelings, thoughts, and behave differently in different situations. We also talk about organizations in OB. The main goals are we need to create some systems or procedures for companies, some solutions will be designed by OB practitioners. OB has roots in the other disciplines when we talk about, for example, attitudes, perceptions, emotions, psychologies there. When we talk about team building, then we refer to sociology. And when we talk about decisions or decision making approaches, economics is dominant. Political science is in OB when we talk about authorities, powers, dominance, image, faces among companies. And when we talk about motivation, medical science is shining. In OB, we talk about three levels, people, their feelings. When people get together and work towards a purpose, groups are there. And then when groups work inside one big system, organization is another level in OB studies. OB is popular or very important for both employees, their employers who perhaps need to hire them, maintain them, recruit them, coach them, or organizations around the world need to have access to the findings and practices of OB. Then, OB is working hard in order to reach some outcomes. Now, number one, to build a better working environment, work attitudes, job satisfaction, organization commitment. These are the outcomes of OB. OB also works hard to increase the performance, job efficiency, customer satisfaction. Sometimes if OB doesn't work really well, then we have counterproductive work behaviors that I'll tell you more about that. In this course, we also work on some key concepts like employees, thoughts, attitudes, emotions, team working, decision making, motivation, uh, how to hire skilled workers, the well-being, both physical and mental, or organization structure, and some other external factors like the community, governmental decisions, charities affecting different organizations' uh, behavior or culture. That was a, like an overview to the world of OB. Now the next part, part A, we want to work more now on personality, the importance of it, and how can we refer to it in the world of workplace. When we talk about personality is, in fact, some unique patterns of thoughts, feelings, behaviors that distinguish a person from others. For example, sometimes uh, some examples like 
Some people call themselves generous, caring. Uh, I'm a perfectionist. These are all examples of personality. And when we talk about traits, in fact, are the labels we put in order to identify different types of more than 100 types of personalities in a better way. So traits are indeed labels we use to name different types of or different patterns of thoughts and emotions. Uh, when we talk about this, we need to also consider two things, nature versus nurture. So when we say nature, some people believe that we are born with some uh, unique patterns of thoughts. We inherited that from our parents. However, other scientists believe that no, when we communicate with others in, in society, when we socialize, we learn these things from our friends, managers, parents, etc. So there has been still a kind of a debate which one is more dominant, but we can't deny both factors are important in order to shape your personality. But this is only a very general definition of personality and the nature of it. But how can we relate it to the world of business? Uh, basically, tomorrow, if you want to work in a company, tomorrow, if you want to work in a, as an HR specialist, or if you want to work as an MBA student in a company, it's great to know that personality in business uh, has been defined basically in two models. Model number one is something called canoe or big five. So there are different names for it. So what is this? Many managers, companies uh, try to ask their employees to take this test in order to get a better picture of their employees. Who is working with me? Uh, what are your key or dominant personality traits or patterns. So some companies like Big Five or Canoe, some think that I uh, believe that uh, the MBTI is more dominant. But what is this? Uh, when you look at this five categories, this is a very broad classification of personality. So you can see here that some people are more conscientiousness. And that is mean more organized, okay, disciplined, more hardworking, thorough, goal focused. So maybe you take the test and it says that your level of conscientiousness is really high or low. Uh, some people, when they work in companies, they okay, report that they are more agreeable. So agreeableness is another thing. They are, of course, more helpful. Uh, they are more tolerant flexible, sometimes generous. They don't think about themselves. They try to be always supportive. Ne neuroticism is another one. And this kind of people sometimes are anxious. They are worried about the consequences of their actions in companies. They are not really uh, feeling, well, what's going on next in my position? What if I get some negative things from my manager? What if I face some challenges if I take on this project? So some workers can be attributed to this kind of personality category. Another number four is openness to experience. Of course, some workers, employees uh, who are very creative, curious, um, autonomous, and uh, they can belong to this category. And finally, we have extroversion, those employees who are energetic, more sociable, outgoing, and talkative. So it's good to know uh, what are your important features. I'm sure you guys took this test on your Connect website and got a better picture of it. Now, when you have it in your hands, is the time that we little bit evaluate this model. Now, where? We don't want to just talk about psychology. We want to see the connection between psychology and the real workplace. Now, perhaps when you are first aware of your personality classification, then we can talk about what type of a performance is better for you in a company. For example, 
if you have a high amount of conscientiousness, like discipline, autonomy, your mind is more disciplined, perhaps uh, your okay, performance is really good. So you are a proficient task performance. Sometimes if you're a little bit emotional and you're open to some new experiences and you want to see okay, different challenges, so your performance is more adaptive. You can work with different teams and then share your ideas, collaborate. Sometimes if you come to one company and based on your test result, you're more open to experiences. You're more open to be creative and you don't want to do routine things. And you always think about your future. How can I make this place a better place? So the type of your performance is company is more likely to be proactive task performance. So when I know you as a manager, what kind of personality you own, probably I can predict your future performance in my company, right? So that's why this test is important for managers. Uh, another positive thing, when you are more agreeable, you want to help people, you are the right person for my company to provide support for new employees, to give them training, to be a mentor for my new hires. And the last one, the job performance isn't always beautiful or positive. Sometimes, as I told you before, we have CWB, counterproductive work behaviors. And it's the time when you want everything for yourself, when you just work to be an autonomous worker and you don't want to share, you don't want to help people. So all these things, but in a negative way, you create a CWB environment. So that creates lots of challenges for companies. Now, on this slide, you can see the connection between your personality test and your real workplace. Now, isn't it better that we take this test and at least know which performance is more suitable to me? right and then you can first apply for that position so when you're aware of your personality traits or features perhaps your eyes are more open and you can make a better decision so this is your level the next level is managers when they know about you so perhaps they want to put you in different teams or they simply ask you to work alone because they believe that you are a more a proficient task performance oriented or employee. The five factor isn't always beautiful. There are of course some challenges with this design. Uh, these scores aren't always, if you get very high things, for example, if you are a very, let's say, um, agreeableness or if you are very conscientiousness, okay, uh, sometimes it doesn't work. Right, because in some jobs you need to be a little bit okay, relaxed. Imagine you work in a car company, and what is your uh, characteristics? Is that you're a very uh, extroversion person. You want to communicate with people, but you see that something opposite happen. People don't want you to talk to you anymore because you are a little bit more than enough. So if you get a very high mark in extroversion, it doesn't mean that you are the right fit for that company. A person with a lower, maybe extroversion, a person who is a little bit cooler, less pushy, can be more successful. Another challenge with Big Five is that our personality isn't static. Of course, till the age of 30, 35, you have already shaped your personality traits, but it is moving. People move to different um, zones of their lives. They work in different situations. That's why we cannot always put you in one category, or we can say that you have you own these three, you're good at these three, and weak at the other two. This is not working. And finally, this category is too general. Uh, it doesn't include some other features like the motives, motivations, or the needs of employees. Now, let's go to part B of our lecture. In this part, I want to tell you about some negative 
personality types. And why is it important? Because as you believe, we don't always face people with positive uh, personality traits. Of course, there are some people with negative ones. And uh, so it's good for us to know these three important categories. Now, the Canadian um, okay, scientists, in fact, two, two Canadian researchers um, worked, on, worked in this area, published a paper, and they call it the dark triad. And when we say triad means three, because there are three, uh, which is very common. The first one is Machiavellianism. And in Machiavellianism, in fact, is the time where, um, so you want to get what one's one at the expense of others. It means that you want to kill all those like, competitors in order to get what you really think you deserve. And uh, many people try to deceive other people, try to mislead them, or maybe controlling others to become the winner. If you see someone in this category, perhaps they are suffering from this dark side of personality. These people hardly can empathize with their co-workers because they don't really understand them. So this is very important. They don't care about moral principles. And they always think that uh, getting more than what they deserve is acceptable. Anything you can do to get the best things. Now, the next dark triad or the next item here is narcissism. And when you talk about narcissism, is just focus on yourself. And you believe that you are the God. Uh, you are the knower. And then, so this person perhaps believes in, in his or her uh, superiority. Of course, some feelings of envy, jealousy, or feeling envious is dominant among such people. The last triad or the last item in this triad is called psychopathy. And this is the most critical one. This is, I can say this is the extreme version of this triad because people who are in this um, category uh, perhaps uh, don't care about the other's feelings. Um, they don't show empathy. And at the same time, they feel okay. They feel happy when other people face failure. And that's the problem in this one. Now, when you look at these three, so the next, uh, so the one thing that I wanted to add here is that uh, why why should we study these uh, dark dark triad? Be careful. Uh, people with these features, with these traits, are in fact number one dysfunctional in their team members. They can't really work in teams. So for us, as an MBA student. It's important to know. So whenever you identify these people in your workplace, please think of this dark triad. Which category is more shining for that person or this group of people? Um, also, people with these features, of course, uh, likely, likely try to engage more in bullying and other forms of workplace aggression. These people also try to create or play with some political skills to get better jobs, to ruin others' positions, and to become winners. So for us, it's good to know, and this is a key concept in organization behavior. Now, let's go to the next model. I forgot to write model number two on top, but another popular model we can classify different types of personality is called MBTI or Myers-Briggs Types Index. Now, this model is based on uh, some uh, psychological theory. Um, so there is also a psychologist here. And um, the name of this okay, psychologist is uh, in fact, Carl Jung. So that's why it's called Jung Jing. So Carl Jung was the main okay, psychologist. This person believes that when we refer to psychology, 
So if you look at the purple color here, getting energy, perceiving information, making decisions, orienting okay, to the world, he believes that this is like a cycle. And based on this theory, we have this kind of classification of personality. Some people get that energy by communicating with other people. Those are extroverts. However, some people are really quiet, imagine their world, shape their personality from inside. Then another thing is that he believes that how do we perceive information? Sometimes, what is your personality? Everything you want to understand, you want to get, should be concrete, based on details, facts, real things, then you accept them. Sometimes this is not the case. You look at your manager, you can look at your customer and feel them. Something goes inside your mind, inside your brain, inside your soul. So you understand the information, not just by touching them always, but through your imagination, through something abstract. Another type of personality is the time you want to make decisions. Some people, of course, do it one, two, three. Okay, logical should be very objective in a very explicit form. However, some people make decisions by relying on their feelings, empathy, emotions. Of course, people from different cultures can act differently. Just keep it in mind. When you're looking at this MBTI or MBT, please pause this video and think about it. Which one is your category? How do you get your energy? Uh, number two, how do you perceive information usually from your surrounding? How do you make decisions? Are you thinking or feeling? Are you T or F? And finally, what is your attitudes toward the external world? Sometimes it could be very judging, for example. So you, so you want to make sure that everything is happening outside should be organized based on a schedule. Sometimes your perception of the world is more like spontaneous. You just wait and see what opportunities approach, then you go ahead. Or no, you judge all the steps along the way and make your decisions or look at the world through your judgment. Now, this is another kind of test, very common in the world, of course. A lot of companies, a lot of business managers ask their employees that I want you to go and take the MBTI test. So be careful, guys. Two models, Big Five, Canoe, or MBTI. MBTI is based on the Zhang Jin theory of psychology. Just, just put it in your mind. Of course, there are some problems when we look at this. So even MBTI is not a perfect uh, tool for measurement when we refer to personality. Why? What are the challenges? So the first challenge is that this isn't really working for in-person work workplaces. Another thing is that um, this is more, this pattern is more like for leadership or uh, maybe it's not really working for team building because a lot of features are absent in this model. So we cannot rely, but this is very common. Many companies around the world use this uh, classification, this N index, mostly for training purposes, for mentorship programs, uh, very popular. Thank you very much for listening. If you're a little bit tired, please make sure you pause the video a little bit relax before we go to the next part. Now, so far, we talked about personality, types of personalities, two main models. And also we discussed their caveats or challenges. Now is the time to talk about something more uh, like say persistent, something more stable, something a little bit stronger than only uh, personality. And these are values. Now, when we refer to values, of course, they are more stable, evaluative bleeds that guide our preferences for outcomes or courses. 
of actions, for example. But in a very simple language, values are, uh, they, they tell us what we ought to do. They bring norms for us, what is good for us, what is bad for us. They have been with us for a long time, from our family members, our father, our previous managers, the value is rooted inside us. Of course, they uh, direct your motivation, they also um, direct your decisions and behavior. So when we talk about values, one thing that is not mentioned here, but please write it down, there could be different levels of values. When you think of yourself, of course, you do have some personal values in your life. For example, you believe that okay, security is very important for me and for my family. So this will affect your behavior. If you want to buy a car, if you want to buy a house, if you even want to find a job, perhaps you're looking for a more permanent job rather than a temporary one. Why? because the value of security is dominant in you. So that's a very clear example. If this is only the level of individual, this is called personal values. But when you're working with a team, you are not alone. Now, the next level is called shared values. It's not here, but please write it down because I guess this is important. The third thing is that bigger than your team is your company. Of course, each company has its own values, and that is called organizational values. And maybe even bigger than your company, for example, your country, people in your country, they uh, share a lot of uh, values, right? So that is called cultural values. So just write down, we can say there are four levels of values we can refer to. But how do we see the difference between personality and values? Now, be careful. The nature is important and the nature is okay, different. Personality is more descriptive. They give you a label. You are, for example, hardworking. You are generous, talkative, social, industrious, or disciplined, whatever. So personality gives you a label. However, when we talk about values, their nature is more evaluative. Evaluative means that they tell us what we ought to do. They guide us, they push us forward with themselves, okay? Now, another difference is that uh, may conflict strongly with each other. So what is this? Sometimes when we talk about a personality, sometimes, uh, for example, your uh, personality can be cool and relax, okay? And then uh, in a, another situation, so you might change it and become someone very strict. So this is your personality. This is now your value. Values are stronger. Values have been built uh, for, a, for a long time inside us. We carry them with ourselves. Of course, sometimes we don't notice them in our personal life, but they are inside us, okay? And the final thing that I want to tell you is that uh, uh, some people believe that our personality has been shaped by our nature, as I, as I already mentioned. Both are important, nature versus nurture. However, when we talk about values, values are really shaped uh, in our interaction, communication with our society. So in one word, socialization is the main cause of values in us. So these are the main differences. Just keep in mind when we talk about values, they are more established. They guide us. They act as norms. They act like um, your, I don't know, knowledge test for driving. This has to be done. This is the stop sign. Don't do that. Go slowly. This is good. This is what your family likes. This is not acceptable. So in a very simple language, those are the norms. But the good thing is that uh, how can we bring it to the world of 
uh, workplace or is this is there any model to understand values better of course the schwartz value model is very important and then uh, if you're working in a company or if you take this test please this is very important it's great to know it's a free test you've already paid uh, so you don't need to pay for this test so just go and take it at least the only benefit to you is that you know yourself better. What are your key uh, values? Now, when we look at this, be careful, the book didn't mention, but I want to highlight. We are talking about two extremes. Uh, we have some values, right? Sometimes self-enhancement is our value. I'm just focusing on myself from my childhood, my parents, my society, my religion, told me to become a better person, to get achievements. Hedonism, achievement, power is my value. So it is with you. When you go to university, when you find a job, some, something is pushing you towards, and those are the values inside you. However, in some cultures or at personal levels, people try to go for self-transcendence, so that is that they are not just going to think about themselves. So we think about others. We try to help others like charity works. We try to be more supportive. So it's not only us, it is our people, our society. So some, some leaders have these features because that is their value in their culture, in their religion, they have been taught if you want to be a, be a better person, if you want to be a better employee, a better father, a better mother, try to allocate, devote all your time and energy to, to your children. So this is like self-sacrifice. Okay, that is the extreme version, but it's common in values. And then another contrast you can see in these 10 um, categories on this, this clustered uh, categories is that the, the values for some people would be openness to change. So these people like to be curious, they like to try, they want to try different countries, try different jobs. A lot of Canadian people want to have fun with their jobs. Even if they give up one position, no problem. They think that I'm going to experience something new. Life is experience. Life needs to have challenge. If I live in Canada and then I want to go to Europe, no problem. That is part of my life. So these are the values maybe inside you and these are called openness to change. However, on the other hand, conservation is something different. So you want to keep your status, keep your position. You are really satisfied with what you have because this is with you from your childhood from your adulthood, that you want to keep your traditions, uh, just to have security, have a safe life, live in one place, have children, I don't know, keep this position forever, just go on. So all these values are important and we need to respect them, right? Now, the next thing that when we talk about values, um, how can we study them better? How can we classify them? Perhaps uh, when we talk about values, uh, just one thing that I want to tell you guys and think about it is that uh, we need to have a kind of a study of moral principle of values. When you, when you have a system of a study, that system of a study is called ethics. I'm sure you heard a lot. So ethics, study of moral principles and values. Exactly. If you want to talk about values or moral principles, uh, you need to have an umbrella term, a mother term, and that is ethics. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure you, you heard of it a lot in the past. Okay. So that is a scientific study of moral principles and values. Uh, when we talk about ethics, uh, let's just go talk about four ethical principles uh, very common in the world. And when we talk about principles, these are like the pillars 
These are the main uh, components of ethical behavior. Uh, this means that almost people all over the world, all companies should believe in these principles. Uh, a lot of companies follow this. Now, the principle number one is okay, utilitarianism. And when we talk about this, uh, some people believe that we need to provide the best service for people. Outcome is very important. And we need to really do our best to okay, provide the best service for people. So okay, satisfaction is the goal. Now, this is also a, a principle. Now, is everything okay or is it fine? Well, to somehow know, because if you want to put all your energy on the outcomes, um, maybe your outcome seems fine to you, but that is not the outcome for other people. Okay, so that could be the area of problem with okay, utilitarianism. Principle number two, you heard a lot in the past, individual rights. So you believe that everyone has some, uh, for example, natural rights, like uh, freedom of speech, freedom of movement, physical security, a fair trial, whatever, human rights. Uh, this is also fine, but again, that could be problematic. It's not here, but please listen if you want to write down, that's a good idea. So imagine imagine we are talking about one company's manager. So what could be the individual right for that manager? Because uh, I'm the manager in this company, I want to make sure, I want to monitor all your private messages for the sake of my company, right? So is this okay? Yes, because that's the right, the right of this person, individual right. But how about your right? Is it okay someone looks at your private emails or chat box and then monitor that? So maybe it is ruining your private uh, uh, privacy. And that's the issue again with, with individual rights. So they're not all perfect, but we need to look at them. Number three is a distributive justice that we want to believe that this principle says that benefits and burdens uh, should be okay similar for all people we need to contribute them equally so one person in company cannot work really hard with a low salary one person just relax get a better salary uh, this is in all of us um, we always believe that we need to be fair so fairness is another issue that we talk here and ethics of care helping other people uh, help people grow give care to other people or be more responsive this is a very uh, universal principle uh, one thing that i want to tell you and i love this part because in our next session perhaps i want to ask you to give me some examples all of us who worked before in the past uh, perhaps can remember some examples uh, there are some factors affecting or influencing ethical conduct this is a beautiful thing um, there are only three things they can affect our ethical conducts especially at workplace so let let's say workplace because this is the focus moral intensity moral uh, sensitivity and situational factors now if you want to be someone aware if you want to always shout your ethical rights uh, moral intensity what is that moral intensity means that we always need to know what is the importance of the case that you want to look at it and evaluate it as ethical or not now or in a very okay, simple language when you look at one scenario when you look at one example in your company you need to first think about it, how, how serious it is. Uh, does this affect other people in my company or it's only me? So moral intensity of cases means that how important is that case and how much attention it needs from you or the other people in your company. Now, 
For example, uh, in our book, if you go to page 46, there was one a Russian company when the owner came, he thought that bribery is something with zero tolerance. Okay, so the moral intensity of uh, bribery um, is there. Sometimes some people, for example, um, smoke, <clears throat> sorry, outside the um, working hours or have some um, scandals over the company. So the moral intensity of that is not, is not that strong. <clears throat> Okay, let me just one more time share my screen and then get back to you because I don't want to have any problem here. There you go. So then when we refer to moral uh, sensitivity, write down is the time that we focus on people or the person. Uh, some of us are very conscious or very uh, aware of our environment. Sometimes if you notice something unethical, you react spontaneously. Some people are cool, more okay, tolerant, etc. But that is moral okay, sensitivity. So intensity works on the nature, importance, degree of uh, importance. However, a, a sensitivity focuses on you. How do you see that situation um, problematic? <clears throat> Sorry. And then let's go to the third one. And that's also very important. The okay, situational factors can create some ethical issues. For example, if you receive some pressure from your boss or manager, perhaps that can create a uh, uh, little bit more uh, problems in your, in your ethical aspects. And that will shape it. Now, <clears throat> Sorry, again. Now, the okay, supporting ethical is the next thing that I want to mention quickly. A lot of companies, organizations, even University of Canada West, they do something to promote the ethical behavior. Uh, a very common one is when companies publish handouts, including UCW. I also uh, put one copy of our um, workplace uh, ethics on your Moodle, so please go and have a look at it. And then a lot of companies try to educate and test their employees' ethical knowledge through tests, training sessions, coaching, and mentoring. Let's go to the last part of our talk, and that is when we look at values at a little bit bigger context, and that is the context of uh, culture. That's a beautiful thing. If you want to search more, please go and search about high context versus low context uh, cultures. Uh, high context cultures like Asian countries, people share a lot of values. However, in low context, perhaps people do not share a lot of values. They don't have a lot in common. That's also another thing. If you're interested, please go and have a look, search. But today, we're talking about five cross-cultural values. In order to make it easier for you, always think about one scale from high to low. Now, here we have five things. I want to mention them quickly. Then we go and talk about Canada and the US. And that's the end of our week two lecture. So when we talk about cross-cultural, we begin with individualism. In some parts of the world, again, this is the value. People believe that uh, if you want to show your okay, uniqueness, you need to be able to work independently, achievements, uh, power, and then you get, get a promotion. Uh, so a lot of um, countries with this high amount of value can be, for example, Canada, okay, United States. Uh, there are some other uh, countries where collaboration is more common like Taiwan or Venezuela 
individualism is not really dominant. However, they're uh, uh, practicing on more perhaps group working. Um, we have also the term a uh, collectivism, and in fact, is the extent to which we value our duty to groups. So groups are more uh, important here, and or let's say group harmony. Now, highly collective people define themselves by their group membership. So the importance of group membership is important, uh, rather than just personal uh, uh, connections. Now, another thing is power, okay, distance. In some parts of the world, like India, okay, Malaysia, people, the value is that there's always a gap between the managers and employees. So more respect and what they do is a way different than we do. We, we don't need to interfere. So we are from different worlds. However, in some low ones, even like medium to low, uh, the power of distance is very low. It means that people believe that this is a team. And what I'll do is something related to what you do. So you are not my superior. So there's not that much of distance between the roles, positions, expectations, or even the outcomes of their performance. Now, un uncertainty avoidance is another common value around the world in different countries. Uh, some, some people uh, can, can tolerate avoidance. They are more cool and they uh, just want to wait and see what's going on next. Some people cannot avoid it. So uncertainty, avoidance. So that is another thing. And they want to really know, uh, for example, employee with high uncertainty avoidance value is structured Okay, situation. Be careful. Hi, like Greece, Belgium. If you want to work there, the employees expect a very detailed, explicit form of communication with them. Handouts, rules should be available to them. However, in low ones, perhaps they are okay. If something is missing, they don't react sharply. Finally, a beautiful value achievement versus nurturing is also very important. So some some companies, for example, uh, like in achievement things, they focus on outcomes. Uh, okay, decisions are based on contribution. Okay, but when we say low empathy or showing emotions, so achievement again is another dominant feature. So this is a cross cultural. Uh, value describing the degree to which people in a culture emphasize the competitive. Number one, are you going to be the competitive, my rival? So this is the value over there. They are just competing, competing, competing to show their power. Or sometimes competition is not value, but cooperation is value. So a, a competition goes to achievement and cooperation goes to nurturing. Thank you very much for listening. Just the last part that I want to tell you. Now, when we look at, we are in North America, we have Canada versus the US. So when you look at their values, this is a very beautiful chart. So perhaps Canadian people are more a permissiveness. They, they try to um, hire moral pursuits. So they just try to follow the okay, moralities, politeness. Uh, following their rules, and then uh, try to accept uh, the offers easily, okay, rather than American people. Of course, in Canada, they put more values on collective rights, team building, cooperation, supporting, uh, versus in the US, this is not zero and one, this is not like day and night, of course it's not. However, which one is more dominant individual rights, individual progress, achievements? And finally, when we compare these two countries in terms of a religious beliefs, uh, so the US people, American people um, are more affiliated with their okay, religious institutions. Okay, However, Canadian people are less. 
Okay, so these are the things. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this part of lecture. Uh, what we want to do later, so if I want you to take all the important tests in week number two, uh, coming from big five, MBTI, or even values, these are three common tests you guys can take and get the result for your future. When we come to class, we're going to focus more next session on some ethical values, and we're going to look at some real cases and try to analyze them from different perspectives. Thanks again for listening. Have a wonderful day and night. I'll see you soon. Bye.